Excellent, thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Katia Pizzi, director of the Italian Cultural Institute in London. And it is my greatest pleasure to introduce the special event, the English speaking leg of the world tour Lezioni Shashane nel Mondo, or the Shasha Around the World lecture series. These lectures are designed to pay homage to Leonardo Shasha, one of the most significant Italian writers of all times, born 100 years ago, and to explore the specificities of Shasha's reception in Italian and in translation across the globe. One of the most engaged, visionary and rigorous writers of the post-war generation, Leonardo Shasha has been called a pessimist and a radical, a secular and anti-clerical, a Marxist, a quintessentially Sicilian author. This is of course all well and true. However, Shasha's genius easily transcends all of these categories. His ethics, his politics, his moral compass remain a beacon and a civilizing lesson for us all. So first of all, it is my greatest honor to welcome to this forum, Senatrice Emma Bonino. Emma Bonino is of course a long time vocal and incisive ambassador for the person, the works and the legacy of Leonardo Sciascia. So I'm leaving the floor to uh, Senatrice Bonino to give us a few uh, words of saluto. Thank you. Uh, grazie. Uh, do you want me to speak English, Italian, uh, French? Uh, tell me. <laughs> Which, whichever language, uh, English or Italian, fine. Okay. I feel more comfortable in Italian. Va bene. You can imagine. It's not a question of nationalism, it's far from me, any sort of this idea. Simply, uh, it's more, I feel more comfortable in my mother tongue. Now, um, I will be brief, but I wanted to underline two things. The first thing, it has become more and more interesting, even for me, uh, following the lectures organized everywhere. As uh, my knowledge uh, with Shasha was basically on his sense of justice, uh, and the rule of law uh, and his uh, political activities in uh, uh, many years. Uh, we have been colleague uh, in the European Parliament uh, briefly and then in the national parliament. But my knowledge of Sasha was mostly uh, on this sector. Following the lessons, I understand that I didn't know anything and that uh, Sasha has much more um, facets uh, of interest uh, uh, for everybody. And what I want to underline also is the fact that he's dead, all right, but is more um, modern than ever uh, and more necessary than ever. So I didn't knew uh, the relation of Leonardo Sciascia with the French culture or the Northern uh, or the uh, English culture. And for me, it's been quite interesting. Secondly, and finally, I think that we have to pay tribute to the people of Francesco Izzo and others who started this project. Uh, and keep in mind, uh, how much work uh, it, uh, it was needed in this year, uh, so difficult for COVID uh, and other emergency. Uh, but just reading uh, the list of country visited <coughs> and in which such uh, lessons uh, have been organized is quite impressive. It goes from Istanbul to Paris to Tehran to Sharjah, to Madrid, Moscow, La Valletta, and Barcelona, okay? So um, if we keep this in mind, we can imagine what amount of efforts uh, uh, the, the, the committee uh, uh, has been 
undergoing in the past years. Uh, the, the other thing is that today is a special day. Uh, now we have even two links uh, in one day in two different parts of the world, with you in London and later on with uh, uh, San Francisco. Hmm? Uh, that will uh, be uh, greetings will be brought by Benedetto de la Veda, under secretary uh, of foreign affairs, uh, also to pay tribute to uh, the cooperation that the institutes of culture uh, around the world um, have been helpful and cooperative uh, in these efforts. Now, and it's also true that we have a connection with uh, uh, San Francisco. Um, and it's a, like a bridge uh, to the second part of the project. Uh, that the, the connection today with you is the final uh, stop uh, of the first part of the project. And then another one dedicated to North America and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that will start soon and uh, which will have a focal point on September 29 and 30 uh, uh, next year, again in San Francisco, uh, though uh, uh, where the local Institute uh, of culture, uh, Italian Culture will uh, host the number 13 uh, um, colloquium uh, uh, on this issue. So I think that the, the work has been extraordinary. The reaction that I have uh, of people present or uh, in connection uh, has been uh, very gratifying, even for somebody like me that I didn't do much. I tried to help on some obstacles that are typical of my country. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and uh, we were able to, let's say, uh, to surmount all of them. So uh, I just uh, wanted to wish you uh, a good work, uh, an interesting session. Uh, and I just tried to remind every one of us where we come from and uh, where we want to go. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Senatrice Bonino. Your endorsement is very important to us. And thank you for underscoring the sort of global dimension of Shasha. That's, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you for being with us Ciao. today. Ciao, Joseph. Arrivederci. Ciao. Arrivederci. <laughs> and we are, of course, um, extremely fortunate to host as well a cluster of world-class scholars today who will explore Shasha's work and his enduring legacy. And I'll introduce them briefly in the order in which they will be speaking. Joseph Farrell of the University of Strathclyde will chair this meeting and follow on from me with few introductory words of his own. Joe will then leave the floor to Liz Wren Owens of Cardiff University, who will assess Shasha in a transnational framework. Following on from Liz, Daniela Lapena of Reading University will position Shasha and his work within the Anglo-American literary market. And following on from the academic presentations, a panel gathering together the Italian Cultural Institutes of Dublin, London and Edinburgh in the persons of the respective directors, Marco Gioacchini, myself and Chiara Avanzato will briefly illustrate the publishing history of Shasha's Favole della Dittatura, or Fables from the Dictatorship, a newly published volume, and literally a volume hot off the press. And I can testify that the volume was published yesterday, and today literally is in the post and will be reaching London, hopefully on Monday. So it's a shame I don't have a copy to show you, but I will do very soon. And Joe will expertly talk about the fables read excerpts and say a few words about this absolute gem of a translation by Anne Goldstein. And before I leave you, let me thank once again our speakers, together with the Shasha Centenary National Committee, 
the Association Amici di Leonardo Sciascia, the Università per Stranieri di Perugia, the Istituto per l'Enciclopedia Italiana Treccani, who are streaming this event. And last but not least, I would like to thank uh, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation for this unique opportunity to celebrate Leonardo Sciascia and his work in a global perspective. So I'll leave the floor to Joe Farrell now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Katia. Um, we've started off quite magnificently and I'm sure we will continue on the same high level. This is, as has already been mentioned, the centenary year of the birth of Leonardo Sciascia. Here in the English speaking world, we have a particular point of celebration, which we'll come on to. That is to say, in this year, we have seen the first publication in English of the first work of Leonardo Sciascia, that is to say, his fables. This was already celebrated with um, a meeting, virtual meeting organized by the Italian Institute in Dublin, but we'll come on to that <clears throat> later on. Uh, in other words, there's a double point here. We are part of a worldwide celebration of this remarkable author. At the same time, we will celebrate the specific fact of the translation into English, a splendid translation by Anne Goldstein, who unfortunately cannot be with us this afternoon. But it will give us the chance to celebrate his work. I have been involved recently in writing a book about Shasha, and I have been overwhelmed by the sheer volume of works which have appeared on Leonardo Shasha. I have no wish to denig denigrate any of his contemporaries, but I doubt if other excellent authors, Calvino, Moravia, Ginsburg, Morante, I doubt if they have um, exercised such a continuing uh, level of fascination, if they still mm, arouse the level of interest which Leonardo Sciascia does. And we can debate this afternoon why that's so. And I will simply make two very brief observations. One which we should not forget when we uh, discuss other things. First of all, he writes very good stories. He's an excellent storyteller. And that can too often be overlooked, particularly by high-minded academic critics. At the same time, uh, he deals with um, important issues, questions of truth, questions of justice, uh, uh, the status of law, the notion of ethics and politics, matters which are of great importance to us today. Now, as it happens this afternoon, we're going to continue to look at Shasha in the, the world. That's to do with him, but that also requires a number of other artisans, if I can put it that way. That is to say, people who are interested in translation, people who are interested in publishing, as well as also uh, those Italians, the directors, whose specific uh, purpose it is to disseminate Italian literature. So it's my pleasure, first of all, to introduce Liz Ryan Owen who is a reader in Italian and translation studies in uh, Cardiff University. Interestingly enough, her current research project, which is given the name Translating Sicily, Adapting Sicily, which is, uh, will be published uh, soon, explores the way in which Sicily and also a sense of what Shasha called Sicilitudine, which we have to translate as Sicilianness, have been conveyed or constructed for readers and people in Italy and indeed outside Italy. In other words, the translation and adaptation are topics which particularly interest Liz, particularly in the context of Sicily. So, with no more ado, let me invite Liz Ryan Bones. Thank you, Joe. Um, if I just share my screen. Uh... Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. And thank you, Katia. Thank you, Joe. And uh, what an absolute honor to, to share a stage with uh, um, the Senatrice Bonino as well. Um, what I'll be talking about uh, this evening is um, translating the transnational La Zia d'America in English translation. 
Shasha's texts have been widely translated into English and his work frequently appears on university courses in Italian literature. The value of Shasha's texts for those who can access them in the original Italian and for those who read them in translation is often considered to be the way in which they give us insights into Sicilian life and culture and as um, uh, Senatrice Bonino signaled, bring us to think about questions of justice and law. The way in which a number of his works focus on the nexus of hidden power relations and corruptions, such as Il Giorno della Civetta, Il Contesto, or Todo Modo, enables the reader to reflect on the ways in which Sicily may be a metaphor for some darker aspects of life beyond the island, how, as Bellodi puts it at the end of Il Giorno della Civetta, la linea della palma viene su, verso il nord, the line of the palm trees moves up towards the north, as the north becomes more and more like Sicily. The translations of Shasha's work give the Anglophone reader an insight into Sicily society, literature and history. The English translation of Lisi di Sicilia is fascinating because it does all of those things. And in addition, it enables us to reflect on the relationship between translation and the transnational. Stephen Vertebeck defines transnational practices as sustained cross-border relationships, patterns of exchange, affiliation and social formations spanning nation states. Work by Emma Bond and later by Charles Burdett, Jennifer Burns, Nick Haveley, Catherine Keane, Loredana Poletti, and many more have shown that Italy is a privileged site for the study of the transnational at the center of the intersection of European and global networks. As Emma Bond puts it, the Italian case is perhaps at once peculiarly transnational and transnationally peculiar, historically a space characterized by both internal and external transit and movement. Italy itself can be imagined as a hyphenated in-between space created by the multiple crossings that etch its geographical surfaces and cultural depths. I would suggest that Sicily as a geopolitical and geocultural hub imprinted by cultural contact in asymmetrical power relationships with a range of cultures across history, other within the nation itself and a privileged point of transit is even more relevant for an exploration of the transnational. By looking at Sicilian texts in translation, the transnational circulation of texts, the positionality of the reader, the interconnectedness between cultures and the way Italian culture transcends the boundaries of the national, we can probe the transnational still further. A transnational reading of the translation of Lisi di Sicilia highlights three things. Firstly, it can analyze the dynamic and shifting relationships between the reader, the characters and the narrative voice as the text moves between languages and cultures. Secondly, and it can explore the way these emphasize the temporality of reading and translation and the ways in which the reader positionality and relationships with text evolve over time, reflecting the changing closeness, awareness and accessibilities of cultures as translational relationships evolve and shift. Thirdly, it makes explicit the way in which the transnational relationship between Sicily and America comes to color British understandings of Sicily. There has been, as Matthew Reynolds shows, a long-standing tradition of the exchange of people, goods and writing between Italy, Britain and Ireland. But in translations of Sicilian texts, we often see the dominance of the American voice, and in particular, a New York voice. This text makes explicit the way Sicily has absorbed some of these voices and remade them in a way that renders them still foreign, even in English translation. This short paper will offer a brief examination of these three areas, focusing on the first story in the collection, La Zia d'America, the American aunt. With power and its uses and abuses a key theme in Shasha's writing, the paper ends with a short reflection on the way in which the text highlights the power of the transcultural translator. Shasha's Lizzie di Sicilia was translated by N.S. Thompson in 1986, almost 30 years after the original text was published by Ainaudi in 1958. This transla the translation was republished by Paladin Grafton in 1988 and by Granter in 2001. From Gillian Aeneas work mapping the translation of Shasha's text into English, we learn that before the translation of Rizzi di Sicilia, there had been translations of Il Giorno del Civetta, Il Consiglio d'Egitto, A Ciascuno del Suo, Le Parrocchie di Regal Petre, Morte dell'Inquisitore, Il Contesto, Todo Modo, Candido, and Il Mare Colin uh, Color di Vino. The short story, The American Aunt, narrates the final years of the Second World War and the immediate post-war era from the perspective of a young Sicilian boy. The boy's family in America, his maternal aunt, her husband and his cousins, are in contact with the family by letter during the last two years of the war, sending parcels and come to visit after the end of the war in a visit which provokes tension between the two sides of the family. The text explores the power relations between the US and Italy and the language reflects and embodies this power dynamic. 
At this time, Sicily is a contested site occupied by the Americans. The American relatives are referred to as the Americani and are no longer a part of the Sicilian experience in the eyes of the Sicilian relatives who remain behind. The text tries to bridge Italian diasporas, exploring commonalities and differences. It speaks to an Italian reader, explaining the transnational Italian experience of migration between cultures. Through translation, it moves to a new reader, and the translator's voice has to be added to the polyphony, and the text is polyphonic in the way it articulates the voice of different Italian positions, communists, fascists, and brings these into dialogue with the Americans, the soldiers and the family, establishing a transcultural dialogue. In translation, the balance between these two sets of voices moves towards the Americans through the use of English. Perhaps the most visible manifestation of the different lived experience of the Sicilians and their American relatives is in the way in which the Americans draw on Italianized versions of American loanwords to explain their daily lives. These often have connotations of wealth and plenty. The words are embedded in the narrative, then explained in a glossary at the end of the text, giving the Italianized term, its original English term, and the Italian meaning. The Italianization of the words shows they have incorporated them into their daily lexicon and made them their own. You've got a list of words on the screen. So things like storo, sto, negozio, jobba, job, lavoro. Some of the English words are not explained in the glossary, such as Brooklyn and Allo. This reflects how, as Donna Gavaccia has analyzed, Sicilians, including administrators, Italianized American towns such as Brooklyn, Brooklyn, and Rockford, Roccoforte, as the links between Sicily and American strengthened and the words entered common parlance. The way in which the American relatives financially support the Sicilian relatives, sending parcels and money from America, and then when they visit, bring gifts and assert their dominance and superiority, aligns the Italianized English words they use with power. English becomes the language of power and plenty in the text. In this example, the multiplicity of sweets available in America is highlighted by the range of expressions to describe it, whilst in Italy there are no sweets. By adopting the American word candy, the young narrator emphasizes the lack in Italy, distancing the idea of sweets still further from his daily reality by using the American word, locating sweets in the American context rather than the Italian one. Dopo un po' chiuse il libro, tirò fuori il pacchetto della gomma e ci offrì le tavolette. Chung disse, così si chiama. E le caramelle come si chiamano? domandò Filippo. Candy si chiamano, disse. Ci sono candy di tutte le specie in America. Qui, io dissi, non ci sono candy. In the 1958 source text, the narrator, the Sicilian characters and reader are all other to the language of power. In the encounter between the characters, in the source text, the Italian characters move towards the American ones, linguistically accepting and using their new words. This is analogous to the idea of reading, moving the reader towards the text. However, in the uh, English translation, the target text reader is aligned with the language of power and approaches the text from a different perspective. This is reflected in, the way that it, in a change in the way the loan words are communicated. The Italian text is moved towards the English reader for whom the exotic concepts are known culturally and linguistically. Some passages where the new Italianized English terms are discussed are simply embedded in the narrative and italicized to show they were originally used in a form of English. The boy, however, my aunt said was a loafer. Maybe he wouldn't even pass high school, but in the end, it wasn't so bad. He could stay at home and look after the store. In other passages, the translation seeks to show how alien these Italian American expressions would have been to the Sicilian villagers who inhabit a different world, italicizing them and signaling their difference. This one had a shopper, that one had a good job, someone had a store, or someone else worked on a farm. They all had children at a school or a collegio, and a caro, and a iceboxesi, and a washatabba. With these words, which only a few people understood, although they certainly meant something good, my aunt sang the praises of America. These words, job, icebox, high school, and so forth, which are not other to the English reader, are rendered other in the translation by using a version of the Italian-American renderings of the word. Yet crucially, these are not the spellings of the Italianized words used in the original. Jobba, I scuola, I spoxese, wash a tabba are all rendered in a way that the English reader can understand, while shoppa is a different way of using the word storo. They are a phonetic rendering of an Italianized pronunciation of English words. The terms are twice filtered, from the English through the Italian pronunciation, then through the English phonetic transliteration. They're othered from the opposite direction. What we see then are that there are three different spheres of cultural and linguistic experience. 
the Sicilian experience, where the words express unknown concepts, the Italian-American experience, where the words express new concepts that have been assimilated into their experience and culture, and the American experience, where the words express a familiar experience but have been othered linguistically to highlight the experience of the Sicilian characters. If we think back to Vertivac's notion of transnational practices, which impact how people think about and position themselves in society, both here and there, how they undertake aspects of their everyday activities whilst taking account of their multiple connections across borders, then we can see that the characters of the American aunts and the American cousins are very deliberately shifting their positions between there and here. When it enhances their power, they position themselves as there in America, and when they want to claim rights to property, they emphasize their connection to here. I refer just now to the Sicilian experience, the American experience, and the Italian-American experience. And I used American very deliberately because at the time, 1958, some of the terms used may have been unfamiliar to, for example, a British reader. The text itself was, of course, set even earlier in the 1940s. However, the translation appeared in 1986 when the terms would have been familiar across much of the globe in the wake of a growing American cultural dominance. The otherness of the terms in the source text no longer require an explanation and are not resonant of a world far away. Conversely, it's the historical aspects of the text, the historical Italian aspects of the text, which are harder for a reader to understand, certainly in English translation. The story refers to key episodes in Italian figures from the war and post-war period, which may be unfamiliar to the reader in ways that references to iceboxes are not. My uncle said the name of Parry made his guts turn over. Talked to me of Parry, said, I can't digest my food. I have to swallow a fistful of bicarb every time I hear about him. And Moscatelli, I said, and Pompeo Collegiani. As the text becomes more familiar in some ways, it becomes unfamiliar in others. Bond stretches out three layers of meaning in the terms transnational and identifies that each encompasses a sense of flow and flexibility that characterizes the transnational and that makes use of the, the hyphenated trans crucial in its ability to muddle notions of the national as fixed in time and space. This emphasis on positionality, crossing boundaries and stressing and stretching the idea of the national is key to an understanding of the translation of the American aunt. Understandings of the national, both Italian and American, shift as the temporal and geographical location of the reader changes. The text itself emphasizes that the national is not fixed in time or space, as the Sicily the aunt remembers is different from the Sicily the young protagonist inhabits. From America, the aunt remembers Sicily as an unchanged and unchanging place, static. But in America, my aunt thought of this house where she had been born as it was with a red tile floor, the hard bed with its bed boards and horsehair mattress, tucked in a dark alcove, the straw bottom chairs and the oak chest as the only piece of furniture. She wasn't conscious of it, but it was a disappointment to find rooms full of light with elegant furniture. Sicily is a dynamic and shifting space shaped by changing national and transnational concept, context. The key nexus in the text is the relationship between Sicily and America. America is translated for the Sicilian, Amer Sicilian family through the Italian-American gaze, and the transnational relationships are set out for the Anglophone reader through an Americanized lens. One of the terms included in the original glossary, the tombs, is also explained um, in the English translation in a footnote. This informs the reader that the tombs refers to a New York prison. This acknowledges the American perspective, the way the American context frames a, a reading of Sicily. The Anglophone reader comes to Sicily through its set of relationships with the American diaspora and the dominance of the American frames of reference is emphasized. And I think this is something to reflect upon as we look at more contemporary translations of Sicilian writing, such as Stephen Sartorelli's translations of Andrea Camilleri's Inspector Montalbano series, where Sicilian dialect is rendered through an American East Coast slang. To conclude, I want to reflect on the notion of power and transcultural relationships. Throughout the text, the power broker is the aunt, who through her transnational mobility has access to both Sicily and America, their languages, their culture, and the material wealth associated with America. As she translates America for her Sicilian relatives, she can choose what she does and does not translate. In choosing to translate only certain things, she uses her ability to move between cultures as a means of increasing her power rather than fostering cross-cultural understanding. This is telling in an episode with the American aunt's son. The boy, who among other things spoke only American, fell into a state of hypochondria. He said that as soon as he arrived in America, he would run and kiss the toilet, which great phrase my aunt translated for our edification and continued to quote, drawing the boy who was always by her side, near to her and kissing him. 
In a previous example, the aunt chose not to translate the expressions about American life, which had equivalents such as farm or store or icebox, um, in order to maintain the mystery and enhance her own prestige. Yet here, she does choose to translate insults. This emphasizes the potential agency of the transcultural mediator or translator role, choosing what to share to enhance cultural understanding and what to keep shrouded in mystery. Power, as in so much of Shasha's writing, remains allied to silence and is shown to be something to be examined, questioned and challenged. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Liz. That was quite splendid. And if nothing else, and there was a lot else, uh, it will make people very keen indeed to get a hold of your book when it does come out. You've covered a lot of territory. I was taken by the notion of translation, transnational and transculture. <clears throat> and no doubt in your book, you will focus even more in Sicily, since, as you pointed out, we had a whole series of cultures and people passing across Sicily in history, as is mentioned famously by Tomasi de Lampedusa. And um, the idea of power coming to a translator is a very intriguing one, especially since, as I know from experience, the translator is liable to feel a particularly impotent nuisance in some sort of translation. A very interesting paper indeed. Thank you very much. We now move on uh, to the second paper, Daniela La Pena, who is Professor of Modern Italian Culture, Head of the Department of Languages and Culture at the University of Reading, as well as being co-director of the Centre for Book Cultures and Publishing. In other words, she's one busy lady. In addition to that, for a number of years, she was the Senior Editor of the Italians. Interestingly, her research focuses on the role of publishing firms in the literary transfer, and that is something which is very often left out in uh, contemporary translation studies, and also on the role journals play in intellectual exchanges and in debates. Finally, she's also completing a book on Benedetto Croce, specifically on his magazine, periodical, La Critica, which was very important in his lifetime, but has now fallen somewhat out of favour. Um, this afternoon or this evening, she's going to be talking about Shasha in the English literary market. Daniela. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation. And um, I'm very honoured to be here, obviously, and to give my contribution to the understanding of how Shasha's work was um, um, shaped uh, and um, shared uh, in the Anglophone market. Uh, what I'm going to present today is just a snapshot of an ongoing research, um, which is in its coping phase, and it's funded by the University of Reading, uh, and exploring the literary translation of European fiction in the records of British publishing and printing, one of the biggest publishers archives in the world uh, that is held at the University of Reading special collections. But before I start, I should like to thank Anna Maria and Laura Shasha for allowing me access to the papers that are object of this inquiry, uh, the staff at Penguin Random House, the colleagues at Special Collection, and of course, Liz, Obre Liz Bren Owen, Francesco Izzo, and the colleagues at Todomodo Treccani and the Associazione Amici Leonardo Shasha. As I have at my disposal only 15 minutes, and we all know how fast time goes when we have fun, I've decided to sharpen the focus and reduce the reach of the chronological logical reach of my initial aspirations. And so what I'm going to do is to focus on specific uh, archival holdings we have here at Reading. We have documentation detailing the evaluation uh, and selection process and the translation process for Il Consiglio d'Egitto, um, the Council of Egypt, A Man's Blessing, and Equal Danger. But I will offer you instead an insight into the backroom dealings of Jonathan Cape, the firm that together with Knopf um, ensured that Leonardo Shasha's Il Giorno della Civetta, one of the most famous novels in the Italian 20th century was to be translated into English. Now, um, an Italian translation or any translation would typically have a print run uh, at Jonathan Cape of um, 2000 copies. To break even, a translation would be subjected to two checkpoints in the sales circuit, the first occurring after 1,200 books 
had been sold. It was crucial for publishers interested in promoting literature in translation and on both sides of the Atlantic to form alliances to share the cost of translation. Once the book is translated, it would enjoy at least on paper circulation in a book market that not only connected it to sides of the Atlantic Ocean, but uh, also uh, would circulate in the geographical extremities of the Commonwealth. Uh, certainly, um, this was the reach of Jonathan Cape and other but uh, other linked uh, but more peripheral book market uh, markets that were in the reach of the American publishers. Uh, and this would include the Philippines or other pockets of Southeast Asia, just to give you a sense of how wide uh, translation could potentially circulate. Um, so here we go. Um, the journey of Shasha's Un Giorno della Civetta starts in earnest in 1961, soon after his publication uh, with Enaudi. Charles Bode, a literary agent with some literary proclivities himself, a lover of all things Italian and well connected with Eric Linder's Agenzia Letteraria Internazionale, propositioned the title first to Bodley Head at the time directed by Marx Reinhardt, who tasked the paperback uh, manager Guido Waldman with providing a reader's report on Shasha's novel. Now, it may come to a surprise to Shasha's lovers uh, in the Anglophone uh, world, but Waldman. Um, wasn't really moved by <laughs> Il Giorno della Civetta. Baldman is also one of the key gatekeepers of, uh, for the translation of Italian literature uh, in the UK. And if you wish to know more on this important translator, agent, and professional uh, publisher, you should read Sara Sulem's forthcoming article in uh, the latest issue of The Italianist. Uh, the, the piece is uh, entitled Reading for Translation, uh, Assessing Italian Fiction for British Publishers, and it's part of a special issue that uh, Sara and I have co-edited uh, and that will contribute, we hope, to the understanding of the reading practices used to evaluate translation, both in the Italian publishing system and in the Anglo-American one. Baldman's report uh, on Il Giorno di Cervetta is uh, typically succinct and matter of fact. A young Sicilian, he writes, writing about his own part of the world, a short documentary thinly disguised as a novel about the mafia. Uh, Shasha's conclusion is that there is simply no fighting the mafia. One just doesn't know where to begin. One hook a fish and pull on a line, and before you know it, you've pulled out a well-connected MP or even a cabinet minister is quick to tell you where to get off. The dialogue is good. But generally speaking, if we were to take on Shasha, I don't think this would be the book to start with. From no point of view, it is of unusual distinction or interest. Some words here are key to the way Shasha's early reception was bound up with the way Italian fiction had been viewed, presented and marketed since the end of, of the war. Neorealism is never explicitly mentioned by Waldman, but the definition of a realism that borders on documentary lends itself to a shared perception of the Italian neorealist literary style. However, this is not enough, at least in Waldman's eyes, to warrant the interest of a British public whose hunger for plot and well-crafted dialogue. This rejection from the Bodley Head does not stop Charles Bode from approaching other publishers, and so he goes uh, to uh, Jonathan Cape, and this happens in June 1961. Candid about Baldman's rejection, Bode explains that Baldman objected partly to the length uh, of the book, as you can see is quite thin, uh, and partly uh, because it isn't strictly a documentary, nor does it quite adapt to a novel, although Waldman speaks of the author's unusual grasp of dialogue. Uh, now, Val uh, Bode, uh, the literary agent, is uh, very keen to establish the literary credentials of Shasha. Shasha considers this piece definitely a work of fiction, although it moves on solid grounds of facts present in Sicily. Indeed, he mentions in the note on page 1935 that he had to cut it down considerably because certain things, he said, certain personages introduced would have been too much for the susceptibilities of the establishment and would have landed him in trouble with the Italian law. And of course, here, uh, Bode is referring to the, uh, um, the uh, note that is attached at the end of El Giorno della Civetta. This letter would catch the attention of, Jonathan, uh, of uh, Thomas Mashler, one of the most formidable publishers of the 20th century, and at the time climbing fast on the promotion ladder of Jonathan Cape. 
In the space of two years, it will be man the managing uh, director of the entire firm and inject some serious ambition in the Cape Literary list. Two things caught Marshall's attention, the marketability of a mafia-related novel and the possibility of a scoop, should he be able to persuade Shasha to reinstate, at least for the English translation, those pages omitted from the Italian original. Obviously, this would never happen. Uh, this is when now the network of specialized and semi-professional figures who are endowed with a cultural capital that allows them to act as mediators between the anglophone or British publishing market and the Italian one comes to the fore. And I will take some time now to describe this uh, um, literary ecosystem. A second reader's report was commissioned to Ruth Max Smith, uh, the first wife of the eminent historian, uh, Ruth Elman, now uh, Viscountess Ransomon. Uh, she's a very busy lady too, <laughs> which uh, reached, uh, you know, this second report reached uh, uh, Tom Mashler in September 1961. At the same time, um, uh, Linder of the Agenzia Letteraria Internazionale informs him that the book was being optioned by not at the, in New York and hoped, of course, that Jonathan Cape could get on board to share the costs of translation. Mashler agrees uh, in a heartbeat to publish uh, the book with Knopf, and in September 1961, the search for the translator starts. Uh, and aside conversations also take place with Linda uh, to intercede with Sashasha to consider publishing the complete manuscript, which becomes a kind of, uh, um, you know, quest for Mashler that unfortunately he will have to, uh, at some point, leave behind. Um, on the 8th of October 1961, Archie, uh, Archibald Cahoon, a very eminent translator from Italian, agrees to consider the translation from Il Giorno della Civetta, while he also acts as a reader for uh, Pratolini's novels. Uh, Maschler, in, at this moment in time, is very busy creating a list of uh, Italian titles, and some of the translators that we are uh, going to mention or um, mediators will be also involved in a, a longer project, uh, the translation of Una Vita Violenta by Pierpaolo Pasolini that will take 10 years to complete. Okay, so uh, at least we know that um, the translation of uh, Shasha's Il Giorno della Civetta will, will appear in print in 1963, so uh, nothing compared to the Odyssey uh, for uh, Pasolini. Now, um, Cahoon was, uh, had been a very important translator from Italian, as you can see from the titles here, just a handful of the very important uh, novels that he was, uh, um, you know, um, busy, that had been busy translating. And um, in a letter to Maschler, he says that, you know, he shows his knowledge of, of the author and he says each of Shasha's books has its own qualities and defects. And this seems to me to have a lack of pressure, which may be intentional and some technical faults, long informative monologues, for instance. In some ways, I prefer the author's other books but is well worth trying anyway, particularly since Sicily seems to apply nowadays in some odd way, and Shasha and Bonaviri are the only living Sicilian writers in the Berga tradition, vaguely, that I can think of. Now, it may surprise to have Shasha, Bonaviri and Berga in, you know, lumped together, uh, but this was a, a common um, uh, pitch line used by translators to show awareness of the Italian um, uh, context and to, you know, prop uh, in a way the, you know, prop up the, um, um, the, the reach uh, and the potential uh, of uh, the author on hand. Cahun pushes for a delivery of the manuscript by autumn 1962. This sends a master into a frenzy. The book is too short, 43,000 words. Why can't he do it earlier? And uh, for this reason, Maschler contacts Isabel Quigley, who is also a very busy uh, translator. Uh, she would translate from Italian and, and Spanish. Uh, she turns down um, the offer, uh, but uh, she's also part of this entourage that is called upon by uh, Thomas Maschler to ensure that the Shasha will see the light of day. Um, Cahoon agrees to submit 
the draft by July 1962, and a further correspondence had at the archives here, Reading contributes to depict um, uh, uh, a more complex ecosystem network of advisors on all matters Sicilians um, that um, include, for instance, uh, even uh, Margaret Preston Guido, also known as Piggy Peg, uh, sorry, Peggy Piggott, the archaeologist at the, uh, uh, the center of the recent Netflix film, The Dig, uh, interpreted uh, by Lily James. Now, Margaret Preston Guido was an archaeologist that she had married uh, Luigi Guido, uh, a Sicilian himself. Um, she had translated several texts uh, of Italian archaeology and her proximity with Italian culture, um, with, with Sicilian culture was used to, um, you know, advise on Shash. And indeed, Luigi Guido would also advise on Yizzi di Sicilia. He would press Liz for the translation of Yizzi di Sicilia. At this moment in time, um, 1961, uh, Cahun is also very busy. Uh, he's working as advisor on the set of Visconti's The Leopard. Uh, and, uh, and this is one of the moments in which Shasha's trajectory uh, crosses Tomasi di Lampedusa. And he will decide to move to uh, Palermo for a few months to immerse himself into Sicilian culture, to be closer to Visconti, and uh, to start in earnest the translation. Uh, and this is when we have a number of letters from Cahun informing Mashler of his encounter with Arthur Oliver, who had translated Indro Montanelli's Storia di Roma for Collins in the same year. He is the son of a prolific and popular writer, Oliver Onion. He was is married to Sicilian, living in Sicily, and Cahun introduces him as a, a steeped in mafia and Sicilian culture. Uh, a translator of the Four Cart in Sicily by Antonino Buttitta, uh, Oliver is uh, very keen to translate Shasha, and um, Cahun is also very keen to push Oliver uh, in the you know uh, to Mashla, and um, this will not happen. You know, um, Cahun uh, was keen for Oliver to take uh, the commission, uh, but Mashler um, essentially refuses. Uh, but it is uh, thanks to Oliver that the working title of the translation carries uh, a Shakespearean flair. Uh, the working title of the translation was The Owl by the Day uh, citation, according to um, um, Oliver of King Lear. I, I doubt that, but never mind. It's a, I think it's a Henry. Um, the proposal uh, to transfer the contract from Cahun to Oliver, as I said, um, falls on the deaf ears of Mashler, who declines because reading the sample translation finds it brisk and fresh, but also uh, tending to jerk along slightly. Uh, but this is the interesting thing. Mashler pushes for Cahun to retain authorship because, as he says, I feel strongly that your name will help towards making the book a su the success it ought to be in England. Under the circumstance, perhaps it would be an idea if Cahun, uh, Masher advises, came, came to some private arrangement with Oliver, whereby, I cite, you could use his specialized knowledge. But if you like to do this, we would certainly be prepared to give him the appropriate credit on the book. And so, as we know, this will happen. The manuscript of Owl by the Day will reach Mashler at the end of October 1962. And this is when the problem with tone uh, comes to the fore. There are normal you know, periods of uh, amendments and uh, uh, corrections. Uh, the problem with the tone is a fundamental issue for any cooperation between Italian, sorry, British and American uh, translations because we, they need to get the right tone, steer away from uh, between over colloquialism with expressions that inevitably refer to things in England and formal conversations with, of course, uh, the conversations in, mafia, in, in uh, the Il Giorno della Civetta were certainly not. Okay, um, extensive corrections so do take place. The new manuscript um, is finally sent to Blanche uh, Noff 
who writes to Maschler in January 1863, a bit alarmed, she finds the translation fine, but is surprised that the book doesn't really offer the picture of Sicily she was expecting and doesn't seem to be specific in any sense. The plot is meager, she says, and the book seems slight. What are we to do? So to ensure that the Sicilianness of the book is clearly signaled, there is an agreement to change the title of the book. And this is where uh, um, An Owl by Day uh, is uh, ditched in favor of um, Mafia Vendetta. And this change of title happens in earnest at the end of January 1863. The interesting thing is that the translators are informed of this change of title only in March 1963. Um, Oliver, um, however, continues to be incredibly committed to uh, the uh, um, translation of Shasha's work. He writes uh, in March 1963 to recommend the translation of Il Consiglio d'Egitto, which of course will be translated and published in 1866. Um, he also uh, contributes to um, uh, informing Mashla uh, of the ongoing um, um, episodes of the Mafia War uh, that will uh, pinnacle, as we know, on the 30th of June 1963 with uh, the Chakuli massacre. And this, there is a letter of Arthur Oliver where he says, judging by the amount of mayhem and dynamiting of vehicles with the consequent repression, which had been going on in this neck of the wood for some time, the Mafia is giving Jonathan Cape a lot of advanced publicity. And to end uh, this uh, conversation, this, this paper, I would like also to say that Oliver uh, would author also a small pamphlet uh, entitled The Mafia Menace to Palermo, where he details the fight for supremacy between the La Barbera and the Greco clans leading up to the Chaculli massacre. And there is no doubt that uh, he will be uh, a great advocate for, um, uh, for uh, Shasha's works. Uh, certainly trying to advise Jonathan Cape uh, on uh, the, uh, the worth of Leonardo Sciascia. And after the translation of Mafia Vendetta, of course, um, uh, Thomas Marshall would not need any further convincing, uh, but it is important, I think, that this voice, uh, the voice of uh, Oliver, that has not been really given uh, so much attention, uh, is allowed to emerge from the depths of the archives here at Reading. And thank you. Uh, here I uh, conclude. Well, once again, I'm very happy to um, thank you. What was quite fascinating in that talk was you took us into a world which will be pretty well unknown, uh, even to people with a deep interest in literature. You took us into this important uh, world where people are um, do have literary interests. They're not all barbarians, they're, they're not all Philistines, but they also look at the marketplace. I used to help students that if they wanted to translate a poem, a play, and pin it over their bed, in their bedroom, they could do what they wanted. If on the other hand, they wished it to go out into the world, then they had to take cognizance of dramaturgs and theatre, of editors and publishing houses, and possibly also the editors of um, small magazines. You've given us a very valuable insight uh, into what's been going on there, particularly when Shasha was unknown in Britain and for that. We do very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting indeed. Okay, we now move on because if we've been talking about the intermediaries between culture and a, a British or an Anglophone culture, obviously the most important institutes of the Italian state are the various um, institutes of culture. <clears throat> and we're fortunate to have one in London, in Edinburgh, and in Dublin. I feel sorry for Wales, which is left out of this. Um, nonetheless, we have here the three directors. So we're going to listen to what they have to say. And at this point, we're beginning to turn the focus over to the specific work, which has come out recently and which has been made available through the agency of the Institutes of Culture. That's to say the translation of the fables of the dictatorship. So. Can I invite Marco Joachini 
who is the director of the Institute in Dublin and who has already hosted the session specifically on this. Can I ask him to come in now um, and um, give us his views? Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, I'm very pleased to be here in this uh, Shasha's lesson. And I'm going to say a few words upon the genesis of the translations of uh, Favole della Dittatura. Um, the initiative regarding Shasha's Favole della de Dittatura uh, started with a proposal which must uh, have arrived back in uh, 2018 uh, that stated, would the Institute be interested in supporting a concert inspired by Shasha's fables from the dictatorship? Uh, the email arrived to the former um, director of the Italian Institute of Culture in Dublin, Renato Sperandio, and described a, a fascinating project. The Irish composer and guitarist uh, Benjamin Royer was about to write a series of pieces called the Five Sicilians Preludes for guitar, which could be presented both in Sicily and in Dublin and could become one of the events celebrating Leonardo Sciascia in 2021. So it sounded like an intriguing way to deal with a fundamental author through one of his less known texts and within an innovative and contemporary musical context. So it was at this point that we realized that no English translation of the Favole had been published. So it was decided to ask one of the best translators from the Italian and authentic lover of Italian culture and Goldstein uh, would she be interested in translating? In spite of her mm, very busy schedule, she immediately agreed. And thanks to the generous availability of the owners of the copyrights, the idea of having an English uh, version of the text started to take shape. So at this time, uh, the series of uh, initiatives had started in collaboration with the Institute of Edinburgh and uh, London including the idea of a very special edition of the text, a limited number of copies designed by one of the best graphic companies in Italy led by Riccardo Falcinelli. So it seems now that uh, a couple of years, even three years after that the email arrived at the Institute, the idea has become a series of events that included not only the concert, the translation of, and the publication, but also an encounter between scholars and academics and a series of exciting and stimulating discussions on the ever-growing importance of Leonardo Sciascia in our culture. So as a part of this series of events, last Tuesday, the 30th of November, we hosted an encounter among six different personalities in the academic and publishing world who introduced Sciascia's work and his English translation by contextualizing it with Shasha's wider opus. The concert, including a recital of the fables read by the actress Nicola Rourke, has been performed in Dublin the 18th and the 19th of November. So this is the final uh, point of this uh, longer uh, venture together. And so thank you very much. And I give the floor to Katia. Thank you very much, Marco. That's very interesting. So here we do have an example of the Italian Institute acting as entrepreneurs, cultural entrepreneurs, and introducing an important literary product, if that's not too harsh and crude a word. Right, Katia, this is basically mm. your house that we're all Thank you. Um, in here today. So over to you. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Marco. I'm going to briefly outline the uh, publishing history of this fabulous book. And I will begin by thanking Renata Sperandio, whom Marco Gioacchini has just mentioned as the former director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Dublin as the real force behind this project. And if Renata is listening in, Renata, without you, none of this would have been possible. So thank you. And um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that from the word go, from the beginning, the first time that Renata and I talked about this project, we really wanted this to be a collaborative project of the three institutes. It was always in our mind that this would involve the three institutes in Dublin, in Edinburgh and London in the spirit of sharing in the celebrations of the Shasha centenary. 
So we secured uh, the translation of Anne Goldstein uh, at the end of 2020, and uh, we first contacted the publishers Falcinelli early this year. Uh, we had a little interruption in the late spring and summer, and the process slowed down a bit as negotiations with a view to including images fell by the wayside. And I think we found that the, the question of rights was too complex and complicated in order for us to delve into and get the book out before the end of the Shasha year. So we, we abandoned that idea. But as soon as the proofs, the maquette of the uh, book reached us only a few weeks ago, we really fully appreciated the significance, the beauty, the great beauty of this book. Now it is a truly magnificent volume. It is a limited edition of 600 copies. It includes uh, Joe Farrell's scholarly, but also very readable and very enjoyable afterward. It also includes Pierpaolo Pasolini's review of the favole as per the Adelphi edition. And Riccardo Falcinelli curated the graphic design and the layout. It is printed on paper of the highest quality and the binding is thread sewn. So it's, it really is quite apart from the fantastic content, of course, it's an object of beauty. <laughs> so it's a book to treasure, volume to treasure forever. Um, so I'm going to uh, leave the floor to Chiara Vanzato, director of Edinburgh, uh, who will say a few words about, <laughs> about this project. Thank okay, you. Chiara, there's been a spirit of harmony so far between all three of you. I'm sure you will continue in that vein. So let me invite you now to come in. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Marco and Katia, and good evening, everyone. I'm particularly pleased to add my short introduction to the English translation of Favole della Dittatura. Uh, Marco and Katia have already excellently presented this uh, outstanding project to you, and I cannot but agree that making this Shasha's early work known in the UK and Ireland is maybe one of the best way to celebrate this birth centenary. And it is not by chance that Pasolini, as Katia said, so an intellectual so deeply concerned with the contemporary society as Shasha was, wrote a review of uh, the Fabulier. And the acuteness of Shasha's intellect and his uh, critical gaze, his social and political sensibility is uh, also his way of thinking still current, already emerged in the, in the fabulae. I know I must admit that I am biased when I speak of Shasha. Um, I was maybe eight when my dad told me to Rakalmuta and I met Shasha walking with a cigarette in his hand. Actually, it was his statue since he had died 10 years before. But that encounter, and sorry for this nostalgia moment, was the very first of many other encounters with him, with his books, his voice, his ideas. So I'm used to listening to his interviews and I have recently listened to an interview Shasha gave in 1987 and he said I became aware of what fascism was during the Spanish Civil War when fascist newspapers published a list of Hollywood actors and directors who were to be boycotted because they supported the Spanish Republic and it was, he said that it was impossible for a 16, 17 year old boy to believe that Gary Cooper was on the wrong side. So starting from that, he began to understand lots of things about fascism. And 10 years later, more or less, he would write Favole della Dittatura, beginning with a quote from Animal Farm. And it was in the same year in which Animal Farm's author always died. So, those who do have one of the 222 numbered copies published in 1950 by the Roman publisher Bardi are incredibly lucky, but we have worked to make you feel as lucky to have this, uh, I would say, elegant, actually, as Katia said, as red cover, Italian paper, and, and let's say unusual and beautiful size. So yes, elegant, beautiful, and rich translation of Favole della Dittatura and these fables from the dictatorship is the product of the crucial contribution of all people, Katia and Marco mentioned them before, Marco and Katia included, who were, are part of this project. So I would like to say to them, thank you. 
And without any more ado, I will leave now the floor to one of these significant contributors to the project, Joseph Farrell, and thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you very much. And I noticed that you accused yourself of having a bias. It's a very permissible and forgivable bias, I should have mentioned, that you are yourself Sicilian, even if you come from the other side of the island, from Avila, which is known principally for its wine rather than for its literature, though I'm sure its literature is equally prestigious. But if Sicily is divided into two, as Brancati said, then you're from the other side. Nevertheless, um, you've kept up the tone of um, harmony, and we're grateful to all three of you for your um, part in the production of this book. I can also say, as I said after listening to Liz and to Daniela, now listening to all three of you, I'm very keen to be able to actually hold this fabulous book, which is still somewhere in the um, production process. Okay, now I'm afraid you've got to listen to me when I talk about the actual um, volume itself or about the family. I apologize that I do not have the technological sophistication of Liz and Daniela to be able to show you little images. You will just have to listen to me and uh, allow me to put up some copies of the book. One of the things which has intrigued me about this particular work from the beginning is the fact that it is in a genre which Shasha never again attempted um, in his very, very first period of life. He produced these favoli, then some poems. Let's remember that Shasha was comparatively late in life when he published the first book. He was 29, which is quite old for an author. He had done one or two pieces of magazines but mainly of literary criticism. Um, so then having, so what do we have here? Do we have something which belongs to the prehistory of the development in the career of Leonardo Shasha, Or do we have in the family something which is um, intrinsic, something which is a fundamental first step? Well, I'm going to suggest that even if this work is completely on his own in the overall span, of his output, of his oeuvre. Nevertheless, it establishes values from which he never deviated at any point in his life. Um, oddly enough, he did actually use the word favola, fable, for some of his later works. In other words, there was always a, a I don't want to say quite didactic, it's a rather harsh and brutal word, but he always had something to say. He had a point of view which he was putting forward which is one of the things that makes him um, um, <clears throat> of some importance, that he was dealing with fundamental values in life and politics, the, the conduct of politics. This book was actually published at his own expense. He mentioned it was published by Bardi, but it was paid for by Shasha, uh, Shasha himself. He was typical in many ways of uh, other young authors, desperate to have a break, to get the work out. Um, I've read similar stories about um, James Joyce when he published Dubliners. He sim similarly had, he didn't pay for it himself, but he had to beg various publishers to give them a break, to give them the chance of becoming known. So on the one hand, Shasha was unsure of the quality of this work. And in his correspondence, and we now have this correspondence, thanks to the efforts of this remarkable scholar, Paolo Squilacciotti, who has been responsible for the Adelphi three volumes of Shasha's complete works, we discover him looking for reassurance from some other people. On the other hand, he was also quite specific about how he wanted it to be presented. He was insisted there could only be one um, fable per page. He did not want them all put down. He didn't want them to be published in advance in uh, one by one in, um, uh, in, in various magazines, wanted to come out together, wanted people to get it. There was only a very limited production. It didn't have a great success, but it had, as um, we've heard, one important impact that it was reviewed by Pierpaolo Pasolini with a very insightful and very favorable review. And that was of fundamental importance. The two men then became a friendly. But Pasolini was already well known in Italian letters, so that uh, mattered a great deal. What um, are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing, first of all, with fables, favori. 
That's to say we're into a very definite and precise tradition, which goes a way back to um, ancient uh, Greece. I mentioned I wondered if there might be a relationship, but sadly there's not. But there's a very good book, and I'm sorry it comes out backwards, written by Antonio La Penna, which is called La Favola Antica, an excellent work, published by Della Porta, publishers of Pisa, on this. Chasha, in other words, was specifically tapping into a tradition. He was not branching out on his own. That, by the way, is something which seems to me to be of importance for all of Chasha's out. He was conscious of being part of the Sicilian tradition. He was conscious, he read very deeply in the text of stories before he published the Giorno della Civa. So here we are with a work which is in, <clears throat> on the one hand in an international European tradition, and he was aware of it. We will find him, I'll refer, I'll read in a moment, the first fable, but we will find him referring back to some of the classical fables. For example, the fable of Achilles and the tortoise, you know, the famous story of the race between Achilles and the tortoise, which is won by the tortoise. Chasha specifically references that work. In another one in which he has a, a, a raven, he specifically refers to Edgar Allan Poe. So he was consciously operating inside, um, inside a tradition. On the other hand, the full title, Favole della Dittatura. Now he says Dittatura, he doesn't say Fascismo, but and neither word, neither word dita, dictatorship nor fascism occur in any of the individual fables which he puts forward. But it's very specific to Mussolini. Well, it is. But on the other hand, um, these works were published in 1950. We don't know when they were written. We don't know if he had written them over the course of years. We don't know if he'd actually written them um, under fascism or immediately after the liberation. They were published in 1950. By that time, then the dictator in European terms was, of course, Joseph Stalin. And uh, precisely because he does not, well, there is no question that the reference is overwhelmingly to Italian fascism but it could also refer to any other, um, to <clears throat> any other dictator. Oddly enough, having published this book, which was his first book, he seems almost to have forgotten about it. Um, and later on in interviews, he will tell interviewers he doesn't even have a copy of the book. You will also find him referring to a later work, The Parishes of Regal Petra, as his first book. In fact, it was uh, not at all the first book, this book of work, that he forgot about. It. it was rediscovered by the French, which is something which has happened on various occasions in the history of Italian literature. They republished it. <clears throat> oh, sorry, they published a translation in a magazine called L'Arte. Following on from that, this work, and I'm sorry if it comes out back to front, uh, was published by Salerio, but Fori Commercio. And they only published 300 copies. I'm delighted to see that the Institute has published twice that number. So from 300, we've now gone to 600, but may in the future go up to 1,200. This is a very beautiful copy. Sasha was also very fond of prints, of etchings, and they got the very distinguished um, artist, you won't see it very well, Edo Yanni, still alive, still with us, still working to do this. What do we have? In other words, with a combination of a variety of things, something specific to it to be something part of uh, something which could have an application, something which is tied to his own age, but which is also timeless, something which is very committed, engagé, if you like, but also rooted um, in reality. What I'd like to do is to read out the first um, of the fables in Anne's translation. It's a pity Anne Goldstein can't be here tonight, but it reads, they're all very brief. Superior Stabat Lupus, and the lamb saw him in the murky mirror of the water. He let him drink and trembling stared at that terrifying reflected image. Now I have no time to waste, said the wolf. 
And I have an argument against you that's much stronger than the old one. I know what you think of me and don't try to deny it. And with the leap, he was on him, tearing him to pieces. Now, this is a story which has been told and retold throughout the European tradition. It goes back to Aesop, it's retold by Feders, he's been the two great classical writers, Jean de, de la Fontaine. The difference is that in the classical fable, there was a moral specifically given. Uh, the fable, then there was a moral, um, whether it was dealing with sour grapes, whatever, always did. Sasha does not do that. He leaves you to, in, to interpret it. Within a brutal world, oddly enough, the fables in history are following La Pena, the other La Pena uh, in this particular matter, that the fables always have a slightly pessimistic view of uh, humankind. Um, they, uh, tend, they move in the animal world, but the depiction of the human world behind it is pitiless altogether. This is a particularly uh, famous story. Um, he didn't add his own morals, but really in this case, then the moral is altogether clear. We're dealing with power. We're dealing with power. We're dealing with the pitilessness, the barbarity, the savagery of power. If by the 18th century we come across the idea of uh, the social contract from Rousseau, but also from Thomas Hobbes, in these fables, we're dealing with a world that predates that. This is um, the political system, which is obviously what we're dealing with, as then the jungle. It gives us the impression that every generation of humanity is equidistant from the law of the jungle. Now, I want to add on one other consideration to this notion of a tradition. At around the time when he was presumably writing these stories and certainly preparing them from, for publication, he had encountered, not, not personally, but through his reading, the work of George Orwell. Orwell was not a great influence on him, like Voltaire or uh, Pirandello or Pondal, but nonetheless, he does recur in his um, fiction. So, Chasha attached two, um, two epigraphs to it. One is from Animal Farm, the closing words of Animal Farm when the revolution has been a failure, when the humans and the pigs have taken over and the other animals are outside. So Orwell then pictures the animals who have been defeated uh, outside, looking at a party going on inside the farmhouse, which involves the human beings and the pigs. And the epigraph which um, Shasha uses, no question now, what had happened to the faces of the pigs? The creatures outside looked from pig to man and from man to pig and from pig to man again, but already it was impossible to say which was which. There is another one, a Norwellian element to these fables as well. Coming back um, to this particular one, we do have, as I said, uh, to the one of the lion and the lamp. Then we have the ethics, the ethics of the jungle. It starts off with the quotation in Latin, superior, superior, starbuck lupus. It could mean either the lupus, the wolf, is superior, or alternatively, it was upstream. If you remember, and I'm sure you know the fable, <clears throat> in classical versions, then the wolf tries to justify itself. It says that the lamb is um, polluting the water by drinking from the same stream. The lamb protests that's impossible because it's downstream. There is no such attempt here. The wolf is thinking um, in his own particular way. Uh, he knows what the lamb's thinking because it had been there in tradition. So he quite simply then uh, jumps on the wolf and tears it apart. The thoughts of their back. We also have a moralistic tone, which is given by Phaedrus. And I'll quote it to you in Latin with this very learned company that we have here. Hic proterilos scripta est homines fabula, qui fictis causis 
Irocentes optimum. No need to translate or public like this. But what it means is that this fable is written for those who oppress the innocent with fictitious pretexts. This is the world of the jungle, the world of Machiavelli, and so on. Some others of the fables are slightly more enigmatic and perhaps even difficult um, to decipher. For example, the fifth one consists only of two sentences. The dog barked at the moon, but the nightingale was silenced all night by fear. The nightingale. Is he referring to artists under fascism, novelists, poets, playwrights? Is he uh, meaning that, that they're going to stay silent and the dog is barking, is barking uh, futilely? It doesn't tell us. You're left to make up your own mind. One other that I want to read out, which does have this Redmond's back, um, this time to Achilles. The philosopher's trick made Achilles nervous. And the turtle said, don't listen to him. Sorry, the turtle had been changed, I'm glad to say. And the tortoise said, don't listen to him. Everyone knows how swift your feet are. Rather, I'm the one who should complain. Another time, they came up with a race between me and the hare. Today, that philosopher lassoes your feet to my advantage, but I can barely walk. It's only my long life to get the better of your feet. I'm not quite sure what the meaning of the model of this is, but it refers back in history to the story of um, Achilles and the hare, or Achilles and the tortoise. It has to be a tortoise, even the same word uh, in Italian. And I'll read only one other, slightly longer, but still very short which is exactly this mentality. The fox gently flattered the lion, who listened spellbound with deep satisfaction. And the deer candidly said, Sire, Renard is deceiving you. Not the what he says is true. The lion, so untimely released from the spell, turned on him fiercely. You're a dirty prisoner. Do you therefore not believe that I am magnificent, that I am powerful and just, terrible and good? Do you therefore think that I am a monkey, unable to distinguish just admiration from empty flattery? Renard is a good subject and you are an evil counsellor, and he ordered the deer to be torn to pieces immediately. As I say, we are here in a, a state of savagery, um, a state in which there is no morality, there is, there is no law. The only law is the law of God. This notion, which will recur in quite different terms in Shastra's fiction, is fundamental to all of us. These fables, in other words, are not fables for children. They're very much fables for grown-ups, for adults. They do give us the first insight, I think, into Shastra's ethical and political cosmology. We know precisely where the man who wrote these fables stands and it's where he will continue to stand for the rest of his career. Thank you all very much for listening, if you have been. Right, do I now resume the neutral chairman role and say how grateful we are to everybody, to the speakers and to the director. Um, the directors for making available this volume when it finally becomes available, as well as for organizing this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank, thank you, you colleagues, and thank you, speakers. Thank you, everyone. And I hope the audience, the public, enjoyed this um, whirlwind tour of Shasha in the English speaking world. Ciao a tutti. Buonasera. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.